in this heat, you do need to be prepared. Unfortunately, we get one to three heat fatalities per year. 134 degrees Fahrenheit or 57 degrees Celsius was the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth. And it was measured in the very town that I'm about to enter. Welcome to Furnace Creek, California, where on July the 10th, 1913, a heat wave led to the then small community experiencing what is still the hottest ever temperature recorded on Earth. So today, July the 21st, 2024, exactly 111 years and 11 days later, I am in the heart of Death Valley. As you can see, the Badwater Basin is just to the left. Holy, look at that. And this sign here says we are now exactly at sea level. Furnace Creek has an average elevation of 226 feet below sea level. And I am about to visit it because I obviously love torturing myself in extreme heat. Now, with a mean July high temperature of 126 degrees Fahrenheit, Furnace Creek is not just the hottest town in America. It's actually the hottest community with a year-round population in the entire world. Yes, it may not look like much. I think those are pretty much all of the houses in the community. And it mostly just serves as a visitor center and accommodations for people who are wanting to visit Death Valley, which is one of the most isolate and inhospitable parts of America. But for whatever reason, 136 people do live in this community year round. And there actually is some water in this town, as you can see by all of these trees that just pop up out of nowhere. Now the heat that occurs in Furnace Creek isn't anything to be played with. It's not like Las Vegas where the temperature can get up to 115, maybe 118, 119 one day every three or four years. This is real heat. If you aren't properly prepared, the extreme temperatures here can actually lead to serious injury or even death and deaths due to the heat do occur here every year. There is the gas station of Furnace Creek. As you can see, those fuel prices are $5.91, wow. I guess that was the entire town. We are here at the Furnace Creek Visitor Center. I am going to park very quickly and walk around before it gets absolutely blazing hot. It is going to get up to 124 degrees Fahrenheit today. It is already 105 degrees Fahrenheit at eight in the morning right now. And I'll tell you guys a little bit about why this town exists in the heart of Death Valley in the first place. And even stranger, why people actually choose to live here. I'm going to park under one of these shaded parking spots as I do not want my car to overheat. Now, Furnace Creek is around 120 miles west of Las Vegas, Nevada, and about 275 miles northeast of Los Angeles, California. The closest town of any population would be Beatty, Nevada, about 40 miles away, and the closest city where you'd be able to do shopping for daily items, go to the doctors, etc., would be Pahrump, which is about 60 miles to the east of Furnace Creek. Yes, Furnace Creek is not just hot, dry, and at a low elevation, it is also incredibly isolated. And speaking of hot, it is currently 8.02 a.m., and the temperature is already 109 degrees Fahrenheit. It is gonna get up to 124 degrees Fahrenheit later today. Now, of course, the reason for the extreme climate in Furnace Creek is because we're in the middle of Death Valley National Park, which is actually the largest national park outside of the state of Alaska at 3.4 million square acres, or around the same size as the entire state of Connecticut. But while Connecticut has millions and millions of residents, this entire vast, massive region of California and a little bit of Nevada only has a population of about 300 year-round residents. There are actually only three populated communities within the park itself, and of those three populated communities, Furnace Creek, with a population of 136, is by far the largest town. And look over here, we have the Furnace Creek Fuel and Auto Service Station. Gasoline is $5.91, and it's $7.15 for diesel. I've actually heard that the Death Valley fuel station, I don't know if it's the one at Furnace Creek or the one at Stovepipe Wells, is the most expensive fuel station in the country. And it makes sense. Not only is it in California where fuel is already exorbitantly expensive, it's also pretty much in the middle of nowhere 
in an extremely hot, desolate, remote environment, or if you don't have fuel and you're stuck on the side of the road, it could be the difference between life and death. Oh, look at this, the Furnace Creek Golf Course, 214 feet below sea level. I've heard that the Furnace Creek Golf Course is actually the lowest elevation golf course in the world. It has a full 18 holes. It is part of this, the Oasis at Death Valley Resort, which we're going to be checking out later as we go into the town itself. Let's quickly go down this road though, Fiddler's Campground. So in the actual town of Furnace Creek, there are only two hotels you can stay in. And then most of the other sites are going to be campgrounds sprinkled throughout the park. Over here, we have hotel check-in, parking, restaurants, general store, and golf course. I have to say, I really like how Death Valley National Park doesn't have much fluff. You have the bare minimum services, so you have an information booth, you have places to stay. I think the golf course is maybe a little excessive, but I understand people want to golf. But other than that, it's mostly just unspoiled, raw, untamed nature. I was talking to the park rangers earlier, and they actually said you don't even have to follow any paths. You can kind of just wander anywhere you want in this wilderness. Unlike most national parks where you have to stick to the trail. But wow, look at that. That is a very green golf course. And despite the extreme heat and dryness, date trees aren't only able to survive in Furnace Creek, they actually thrive. And they're providing some much needed shade for me right now as I watch someone teeing up on the golf course. It is early around 8.20 a.m. People are obviously out now because if you want to get your golf in during the summer months, this is the only time to do it. Look at those birds. There's so many different birds on the grass. Now, strangely enough, one fifth of the 1.1 million tourists who visit Death Valley each year actually come during the summer months. And August is actually the second busiest month in the entire park, mainly due to a lot of Europeans who don't have deserts in Europe. They come during August to experience real extreme heat. Now over here on the right, we have the Wild Rose Tavern which is one of two restaurants in the town of Furnace Creek. I think all of the shops and services are actually owned by the Oasis at Furnace Creek. Oh, look at this. It's only open from Thursday to Monday, 12 p.m. You can take a little gander inside at what one of the only two restaurants in Furnace Creek looks like. But of course the winter and spring are much more popular times to visit Death Valley, especially for Americans. And it makes sense. If you wanna get out on the trails, go hiking, you can't really do that in the summer months without putting your life in serious danger. Now, unlike most places with a dry heat where you don't really sweat, I have been outside for maybe 15, 20 minutes. I am visibly sweating. It is very, very hot here. But not only is Furnace Creek the hottest town in the United States or in the world, it's actually the hottest, driest, and lowest elevation community with a population in the U.S. There are 350 sunny days per year. The mean high July temperature is 126 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 13 degrees Fahrenheit higher than Las Vegas, Nevada, which is already one of the hottest cities in the country. And Furnace Creek actually holds the record for the most consecutive days above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It was 43 days lasting from July the 6th through August 17th of 1917. And just looking at weather.com, it seems like every day in July this month is going to reach above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I don't think I was prepared for how hot it was going to be here. I'm going to stand in the shade while I tell you guys the rest of these statistics. The average temperature of July 2018, not the high, but the average temperature was actually 108.1 degrees Fahrenheit or 42.3 degrees Celsius, which is actually the highest average temperature of any month of any place in the world. And not only was the hottest temperature on earth ever recorded here at 134 degrees Fahrenheit, it's actually the only town which has had verified temperatures over 130 degrees Fahrenheit. It's happened at least five times in the town's history, the most recent being in 2021. And this year it already has reached up to 128 degrees Fahrenheit, where sadly a motorcyclist actually died since it was just so darn hot. Now this seems to be the main square at the Oasis at Furnace Creek. Oh, I think this is the Borax Museum. Yeah, let's go check out the Borax Museum real quick. Now, the original reason why Furnace Creek became a town in the first place and the other towns in Death Valley before Death Valley National Monument was formed back in 1933 was because of all the Borax mines all around this area. 
If you don't know what borax is, it's basically a white powdery substance, which is used in a lot of cleaning agents and some laundry detergents. Oh, wow, look at this. These are some old carts. I heard there were 20 mule teams basically that had to carry the borax from Death Valley about 150 or 160 miles to the nearest railroad because they just didn't have railroads back when the original mines were built. It was too remote, but I think these are those wagons that the 20 mule teams led. I wish there were some signs to tell us what each of these things were. What does it say here? Remodeled earth wagon used at Furnace Creek Ranch. Huh, this is some fascinating stuff. The Borax Smith's Buckboard used on trips from Mojave to Death Valley via Wingate Pass, 1885. Wow, this wagon is from 1885. I guess being in the desert, everything's going to be preserved a little better. There is so much history I'm learning in pretty much every place, even the places that you maybe wouldn't think had too much history. Wow, look at this old well or probably some contraption to get the borax out of the ground. National Rocker Quartz Mill Kendall Patent, August 24th, 1886. This is from 1886. Holy. What is this here? Now I think there's probably an app or some type of audio guide where each of these numbers will tell you about each of the things that these are a water cart used in construction of Death Valley Railroad. Yeah, so eventually a railroad was built, not to Furnace Creek itself, but to Death Valley Junction, which is around 30 miles southeast of here. And I'd assume, yeah, this is Death Valley Railroad. The Old Dinah, 1894. Steam tractor and ore wagons introduced at Old Borate to replace the 20 mule teams and replaced in turn by the Borate and Daggett Railroad. The tractor was later used and abandoned on the B.D. Keene Wondermine Road in Death Valley. Furnace Creek Resort. Yes, it might seem just like a tourist attraction today, and it is, don't get me wrong. They have tennis courts, they have a basketball court, they have a resort with a pool, but people have actually lived here for at least a thousand years, the Timbisha Shoshone people. The 20 mule team wagon train, 1885, used in hauling borax from Death Valley to Mojave, 165 miles. It took 10 days, the borax weighed 24 tons, and the entire weight totaled 36 and a half tons. It appears even the extreme heat is not keeping tourists away from this Furnace Creek Ranch. And I'm going to get into the history of this ranch, as well as the town of Furnace Creek in just a little bit. But if you were wondering why exactly it is so hot here, like the scientific reasons for it, it's because air is less dense and thus cooler at high altitudes. This obviously is a very low elevation. We are about 226 feet below sea level, which combined with very little cloud coverage, I don't think there is a single cloud in the sky right now because Furnace Creek actually sits in a rain shadow between two mountain ranges to both the east, or that's the west over there, and then the east over here. They squeeze the moisture out of the air before it can reach this valley, which leads to just 2.2 inches of annual rainfall. Very sparse natural vegetation. Obviously these date trees are a lifesaver and they make the town a lot cooler than it would be without the trees but there's almost nothing to absorb the heat, so it all just goes into the ground and the air. The highest ground surface temperature ever recorded on Earth occurred in Furnace Creek as well at 201 degrees Fahrenheit, or 93.9 .9 degrees Celsius. It was on a day in July 1972 where the air temperature reached 128 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, you definitely do not want dogs out and about on this pavement. Let me actually feel it real quick with my, my hand. It, uh, it's pretty hot. I don't think it's dangerously hot yet, but it is, it would definitely burn your feet if you didn't have shoes on. So over here it says town hall and hotel registration. Wow, there's actually a town hall in Furnace Creek. There's this nice little park with date trees. Very pleasant, elevation 190 feet below sea level. Usually in the dry heat, as soon as you migrate to the shade, it feels 20 to 30 degrees cooler. It definitely is nice, don't get me wrong, but it's still very hot. And directly behind this beautiful courtyard is the guest registration office to the ranch at Furnace Creek, or the ranch at Death Valley, I believe the name is now. I wonder if this was the original ranch that opened back in 1933, the ranch at Death Valley. Nice, beautiful little waiting area, guest registration area. 
I really am digging just the whole vibe of this town. It feels like you've been transported back 80, 90 years. That was a much needed break in the air conditioning. I just looked at the temperature. It is now 113 degrees Fahrenheit, which means we still have about 10 or 11 degrees Fahrenheit to go by the hottest point of the day. But I guess going off of this ranch and all of these beautiful Spanish style buildings, how about we get a little bit into the history and why this ranch was formed in the first place. Now the area that is modern day Furnace Creek has been settled for at least a thousand years by the Tembisha Shoshone people. They actually still have a village just a little bit south of here. We're hopefully gonna be checking that out today as well. But this area was actually a natural oasis due to springs in the Amargosa range up there yonder. But in terms of modern history, while the 49ers stumbled upon this oasis on their way out west to the Californian gold rushes, and it was a much needed place for shade, water, and rest, the actual town itself was only founded after the borax that I mentioned earlier was found in the early 1880s. Businessman William T. Coleman actually opened up an open air borax refinery around one and a half miles north of here in 1883. And then he built the Greenland Ranch, which later became this massive ranch complex that we see today. I believe these are some homes of people that actually live here who probably work at the ranch or for the national park they appear to all be trailer homes. Oh, I think some of them are actually parts of the ranch itself. Human resources is over here. Yeah, so I believe all of these homes are the residential area of Furnace Creek. I know there's also people that live in a Cow Creek complex a little bit north of here, and people that live in the Indian Village just south of here. But I think these would be the regular homes Wow, that must be fascinating to live in a place like this year round. Now I looked up some demographics. The median age here is 54.4 years. But while the population skews older, it obviously isn't a retirement community as only 8% is over the age of 65. I guess while retirees like really warm places like say Phoenix or Florida, they don't like extremely, extremely hot places like Furnace Creek. Oh, look at this porch over here. They got their flamingos, a little camping chair. Maybe they've been there for a while. Now, 44% of the 136 residents in Furnace Creek are male, while 56% are female. In the entire state of California, 50.2% of the state is female. So it's a much higher rate of women in Furnace Creek than in the state of California. Now, race demographics are 69% white, 18% of the population is Hispanic or Latino. 11% is Native American. 2% is two or more races. And there's around 50 or so Tembisha Shoshone people that live technically outside of the city limits of Furnace Creek as it's in their own reservation. Zabriskie Avenue. So I think there's actually a place called Zabriskie Point, which is supposed to be gorgeous in Death Valley. I'm also wondering what the jobs would be in Furnace Creek outside of the National Park Service or the hotels. I would imagine there aren't many jobs outside of that. The median household income is around $41,583, which is 44% below the US median of $75,000, which leads to a poverty rate, which is staggeringly high. This actually really surprised me. 31.5% of Furnace Creek lives in poverty. Childhood poverty is 0%, which at least that's a good thing, but 31.5% poverty, that's, that's really high. Wow, this is actually quite the aesthetic home. They have American flags on their porch, a few bushes. Now, if you're wondering how much one of these homes would cost you, I don't actually know if they're for sale. I tried to look on Zillow for housing data. There is no housing data. There hasn't been a single house sold here in the last three years. And only about 25% of the town owns their home. So, wow, what is this over here? Even in Furnace Creek, California, you have little gardens and little cute places. This is beautiful. It isn't all just catered to the resort. Even Furnace Creek, California has a soul because there are people that I switched over to my phone to record this as it is now actually so hot that my camera stopped recording. It is not functioning. But to go back into the housing data, I tried to look up any type of housing data I could find on the internet and there's just nothing available. I would assume that a lot of the accommodation is included with people that work at the hotels at least, as well as the National Park Service. Obviously, some people live in their RVs and trailer parks. I think this whole area is technically an RV park. And as far as crime data or crime statistics go, 
There is no available crime data, but again, only 136 people live here, and most of them live here just to cater to tourists. So I would assume there probably isn't much, if any, crime. Oh, back behind the RVs, it looks like there's apartment buildings? Yeah, I'd imagine all the people that live in these cars probably live in this apartment complex. So it's kind of like what housing is like in extremely northern communities. I've seen in a lot of places in rural Alaska where it's very bare bones, it's very to the studs. People are there for a purpose, whether that be for oil or the National Park Service or for some type of government. And they don't need much as they probably aren't going to stay there much longer than a few years. But yeah, there are a lot of RVs back here. Oh, look at this house here, it's painted. Coming into Furnace Creek, I thought the actual town itself was only going to be the resort. But no, there's a sizable amount of homes here. I wonder if the population really is just 136, if it's seasonal workers that live in many of these homes. I'm putting my cigarette out because that's rude to be in the interview smoke. Oh no, you're so I'm here with Raheem. And how long have you lived in Furnace Creek? Uh, probably about a month and two weeks. A month and two weeks. Okay. And where are you from originally? Washington, DC. Okay. That's a long way over here. <laughs> so why did you decide to move to Furnace Creek? Um, to work at the Oasis. They have a restaurant called The Inn, and I think it's one of the most fantastic places I've ever worked in my life. <laughs> and so you're a chef or a... Um, I'm a cook. I was a chef in Washington, D.C., so I came here to chase my dream. Just so happens it's in the hottest place in the world. And I guess to go off of that, what do you think so far of this extreme heat? Uh, it's different. <laughs> I don't work in the outdoors, but even indoors, it's still affected because it's so hot outside like your air conditioners you can't keep them too low because of the heat oh uh, why can't you keep it too low um it'll mess up the air conditioner so what do you normally keep your ac unit to um 74 i mean that's not that bad right yeah 74 degrees also we have a ceiling fan in our room okay so you live in this uh I live in this building right building here okay so are these like a lot of apartments in there or? um so on this side is the living on that side is where the visitors come oh uh, so this is all people who work all, at every, the oasis every place in this area is management, employees. So people that work at the Oasis live in these homes here? Correct. How have you found the community being here six weeks now? Have you made friends? Have Ooh, you? It's been probably one of the most amazing journeys in my really? life. I sit in this very area that you sat in there maybe a week ago, and I got to sit with people from seven different continents. <laughs> and Antarctica. <laughs> Everywhere. Name it. And someone was probably from there that sat out here. People living here or visitors? Living here. Oh, wow. So we have what we call J1s. They come from other countries like Turkey, Spain, Beijing, Sudan. Just to be able to work in Death Valley and experience this heat. Uh, to me, it's fun. It's an extremely different environment from where I come from. Here, you're surrounded by mountains. It's nothing for 30 minutes. <laughs> Being from D.C., I'm used to five or 10 minute walk and I can get to anything. Versus here, you have to drive 30 minutes. You're living in temperatures. I think the highest it's been since I've been here is like 128. Yeah, about 115 right now, I think. Uh, let me check. When you live here, you work here, it's 115, and then it's 9.39 a.m. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's going to get a lot hotter today. It's going to get a lot hotter. So you find you some shade, drink your Gatorade, drinking plenty of water. I drink plenty of water. I'm going through 16 cups of water a day, and you have to eat right. Oh, in terms of what? Eat right, like eat lots of fruit, because fruit has water in it. Every morning, I eat fruit. Even at lunchtime, I eat something that contains water in my diet. Other than that, I would say I'm living my best life. Okay. So <laughs> life is really good here. What do you do for fun when you're not working? Um, I go to Perron. Okay. Also, we have like different things that they involve the community with, that they take them to Vegas. They have like game night, movie night, and we have our own pub up here too afterwards. So it's a pretty close-knit community, all the people that work at Oasis. Pretty much, I oh, believe. Wow, that's cool. So everybody has their own little group, but it's rare you find someone that doesn't have a section of people that they be with afterwards. Work. I believe is extremely diverse. It's apart, but together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a very small population in the middle of nowhere, so yeah, you have to um, stick together, right? I think we have almost like 300 workers. Even in the like summertime? That. Yeah, I think oh. more come during the peak season because this is not peak season. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you think you'll stay here for a while then? That is my intention because I think this is a great place. Great energy, fun people to work with. It's awesome. one of the best experiences. And I've been to 20 to 25 out of the 50 states. I think I'm going to be here for a while. <laughs> so I heard 
heard last week there was like a power outage in town. Did you experience that so here as well? It, what we call it is a scheduled power outage. Something that I've never seen before. Because <laughs> it's going to be of. too hot. I came here to work. So now I can't work because of the power's out. So our shifts ran later that day. But in the front office, I think they did a good job making sure that the people here was comfortable. Because we have cooling rooms that we can go to that had power. Oh, like on a generator. Yeah, on the generators. Oh, okay. Me, myself. <laughs> I went to Peru. <laughs> okay. Uh, got with some co-workers and the power didn't come back on at the scheduled time, but it didn't come on to the point that we had to sleep with no power. So I've heard about like unscheduled power outings. I haven't experienced any of them. Yeah. <laughs> to go off of Pahrump, is Pahrump where you have to go for groceries? Everything. So everything. Pahrump okay. has everything. <laughs> so you go there for gas too, that you never, um, you don't so buy it, gas there, here? It, there's a gas station here. But it's very expensive here, right? Oh, tell me about yeah. it. Yeah. So no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> go to Pahrump, there's a gas station right before you come up and get gas leaving and coming back. Would you say you go to Pahrump once a week at least? Maybe once every two weeks. Every two weeks. They have a shuttle bus here that can take you every Monday. Oh, wow. So you don't even need a drive your own there no the shuttle goes there in the morning then they come back towards the afternoon you're allowed to go shop and i think that's great for the people who don't have cars fortunately my roommate has a car so a lot of people <laughs> that work here don't have cars i would say a decent amount especially a lot of the foreigner students oh yeah so have you had a chance to explore the park itself yet um i've been to bad water <laughs> it's even hotter there right <laughs> i think when you come here you have to go to bad water. yeah i'm gonna go yeah but it's the hottest <laughs> point of the day i'm gonna go yeah, to the it makes death valley Death Valley, make Furnace Creek, Furnace Creek. What is the biggest misunderstanding that people who probably think you guys are crazy for wanting to live here don't the understand about Furnace Creek? Biggest misunderstanding. Or misconception. Don't always believe everything you hear. Just because someone says something doesn't mean it's always that bad. Yes, it's hot. That doesn't make this place a bad place. People look at it in a bad way because it's hot versus looking at it like, you know, one of the biggest national parks in America. Yeah, the biggest in outside of Alaska. <laughs> okay, it's hot. Yes, it's hot. It's hot everywhere. <laughs> Washington, D.C. is hot and humid, I mean, right? It's humid in my city. Just humid then, hot of here. Do you prefer the dry heat than to the humid heat? It doesn't matter to me. I've been a chef for five years. Oh, the kitchen's I, always hot, right? It's always hot. I worked over top of a grill that was 480 degrees. I could come out here for 60 days and get through it. It sounds just like, <laughs> obviously, it's perspective. So would yeah. you say everyone that lives here has a very positive outlook on the heat? Some do, some don't. I've heard people here say this heat is like ridiculous. I can't take it. I've watched people come here and they be here two days and they can't take it. Oh, it's like they, they stopped working. And oh, left. no, no. They don't make it to work. They uh, go through orientation and they like, I can't be here. To work here and live here, this is not for everybody. And if Pahrump didn't exist, say this really was middle of nowhere, closest okay. town is Vegas, two hours away. Okay. Would you still be able to live here? Probably so. Really? When you're chasing your dreams, nothing is impossible. No obstacles can get no in No obstacle yeah. can get in your way because you have a goal to get to. Some of the greatest people, no matter how many people told them no, the right person told them yes <laughs> wow. this was a great interview thank you raheem <laughs> you're welcome so raheem was actually just telling me a little bit more about the housing situation so a lot of it is given to employees of the oasis such as this building but some people actually built their own homes which are that one over there this green one and this one here as well I guess the homes that have a little more character are probably people who are living here quite a bit longer. Apparently all of the people who live in RVs here work at the Oasis as well. They maybe bounce around from national park to national park. Look at that person. They had their whole site decked out with some shade covering. I am now back in the guest accommodation area of the ranch at Furnace Creek. All of the employees live behind this gate, which is where I was just exploring. But let's go back a little bit into the history. I'll take it back to 1883 when, as I mentioned earlier, William T. Coleman built the Greenland Ranch. It was named the Greenland Ranch because of all the alfalfa. And he built the ranch as a place to supply food to his borax workers, as well as to serve as a mule train depot for those aforementioned 20 mule teams, which carried borax 165 miles from Furnace Creek to Mojave, California. And I guess to go off of that, how about we walk back to the car and I'll show you guys the site of where those 20 mule teams departed from. Before I get back to the car, Car, however, I believe these are some of the accommodations or the private casitas here at the ranch. I looked at prices. It looks like they range anywhere from about $150 to $250 a night for a regular room. You might think that in the summertime there will be discounts, but there actually isn't. It's pretty much the same price year round whenever you want to visit. This ranch is 
It's beautiful though. It's interesting too, because while accommodations at the ranch seem very nice, there's just massive empty dirt lots here. Like I don't even know if this is a parking lot. It's beautiful, don't get me wrong, with all the trees and the mountains up over there in the distance. But yeah, just empty, massive dirt lots. We're now coming up again on the gas station that we saw earlier. So I looked it up as well. Apparently the campgrounds range from 18 to $22 a night. Obviously in this extreme heat, you are not going to want to stay in a campground. Just, you're gonna get baked alive. The low temperature of the day today is going to be 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So even at four or five in the morning when it's dark, it is going to drop in temperature about 30 degrees, but because the high temperature is 124, it's still going to be very, very hot. Now, funny enough, in the winter time, since this is a desert, it actually gets quite cold. The lowest ever recorded temperature happened about six months before the hottest ever recorded temperature on January the 2nd, 1913. The temperature reached 15 degrees Fahrenheit or negative nine degrees Celsius. Looks like there's some Jeep rental tours over there. I wonder if you're allowed to off-road on these hills, given that it is a national park and usually you aren't allowed to do that in national parks. And I am here with Matthew, and how many years have you lived in Furnace Creek? Uh, I've lived here for four summers. Four summers, and where are you from originally? I'm from Virginia. Virginia, okay, so that's quite an adjustment to this heat. What, if any, adjustments have you made to adapt to the heat? Yeah, Death Valley is you know, maybe the hottest place on earth during the summer months, but just like any other place, you, you adapt, you acclimate, and I've come to really appreciate the Death Valley summer. So you spend a lot of time outside still during the summer, or is it mostly in the AC? I mean, just like if you're in a really cold environment you're probably spending most of the winters inside uh, it's the same here no matter how acclimated you are when you're talking about temperatures over 120 degrees fahrenheit plus this is the most arid place in north america you're not going to spend a lot of time outside in those type of temperatures it's just too hot and i heard there was a power outage last week how was that with the whole town uh it happens it didn't impact everyone within death valley uh, but did impact a lot of the park service staff houses were getting up to 100 degrees 100 plus degrees so obviously staff had to be evacuated out of them and had to go to local hotels that still had uh, proper cooling. It doesn't happen too often, but every once in a while we do get these power outages during the summer. And a lot of people probably would think you're crazy for moving to a place like this. What is the biggest benefits of living in Furnace Creek? Well, I mean, Death Valley has seven to eight beautiful months where mm -hmm. you can go outside, you can recreate, hike, and do all the things in a beautiful landscape. It's just, you know, that four or five months that it is really hot. You know, a lot of places have the great season for being outside and, and recreating, and then other seasons where you maybe huddle indoors a little bit more. And it really is a beautiful landscape. Well, millions of visitors come to Death Valley each year to experience what I get experience every day. What was the original reason why you decided to move to Death Valley? Well, working for the National Park Service, I've had the uh, ability to live in some really beautiful areas. Mm -hmm. Colorado and North Carolina, Virginia, oh, okay, Nebraska. Wow. And I came here during the winter for a job and I just fell in love. And when I said I could work here year round, I decided, why not? So this is your favorite national park you've worked in? Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. And would you think you would go to another national park or is this the one you want to stay for a while? Uh, we'll see, you know, it's all about the journey. But for now, I'm very happy and I, I really love this park. I love what Death Valley has to offer even during the summer months. So I guess during the summer months then, what do most people do for fun? Or um, You know, Death Valley is really special where you've got this Low Valley, which is the hottest place maybe in the world. Just over to the west, you've got mountains that are 11,000 feet tall. And so even in the heat of summer, you can escape to the mountains. You can recreate in those higher elevations. There's still plenty to do within a short drive. There's also swimming pools. You can jump in the pool, do some laps. Okay, yeah. um, evaporative cooling is great in a dry environment like this. Are there any kids that actually live in Furnace Creek? Mm -hmm. There are some kids, yeah. So is there a school or how does that exactly work? Uh, there's a local school district. Yeah, the Death Valley Unified School oh, District. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's actually not right here in Furnace Creek. It's in the town of Shoshone south of here, but it's also pretty hot there as well. Oh, okay. I would never have guessed. Yeah, I mean, Death Valley has about 600, 6 to 800, depending on the year and the season, uh, residents that live in the park. And then Furnace Creek is the largest town? Yeah, it's kind of like the main area where you've got okay. the resorts and the visitor center. And then I guess to go off of that, what are the main jobs outside of the National Park? Well, it's mostly the National Park, okay. of course. Most of the staff are either working for the Park Service or they're working for one of the resorts, which are catering to tourists that are coming into the park. Mm. This is also where the Timbisha Shoshone, which are the people that have, of course, had a presence here here for time immemorial. They still have a presence here today and many of them do still live in the park. Finally, what is your favorite thing about living in Furnace Creek? Oh man, there is so much. But one of my favorite things is definitely the night sky. This is an area that's pretty free of light pollution. So when you go out at night, you are seeing a night sky similar to how people have seen for thousands of years. You know, you can see the Milky Way, more stars than you can count. It's an experience that most people do not get in their day-to-day -day life. So being called Death Valley, do people actually die here from the heat often? You know, 
Often, no. That name is a name that was obviously given in part because of the extreme environment, also because the first European Americans that came here had a pretty bad time. But people have lived in Death Valley, for, you know, for thousands of years, uh, the Dimbisha Shoshone and their ancestors. Unfortunately, we do get one to three heat fatalities per year. Oh, wow. Um, so it does happen, but we see over a million visitors. The vast majority of fatalities in the park are the same as anywhere else. It's single vehicle rollovers and car crashes and, you know, cardiac issues. Oh, so it's uh, not from the heat. It's from car accidents. Often. Now, when you come to Death Valley in this heat, you do need to be prepared. There's mm -hmm. no denying that. You need to drink lots of water. You need to spend most of your time in air conditioning. You don't want to be hiking. Almost all the heat fatalities we do see are unfortunately people that don't always take on those recommendations. So it's just really important to take care of yourself when you come to a place like Death Valley. If you do that, you can have a very safe and memorable experience. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was yeah. great. You're welcome. And Thanks. I'll Thanks enjoy Death Valley from the comfort of my car. Please do drink plenty yeah. of water, but yeah, have fun out there. And this is the Visitor Center and Museum at Death Valley National Park in Furnace Creek. As you can see, it is the hottest, driest, and lowest place in the United States. It's a very bare bones visitor center, very bare bones museum. But I kind of prefer national parks, which are like this, which give you the bare minimum services to make sure that it's not dangerous to visit here and you get a little bit of an overview. But then when you get into the park itself, it's unspoiled, just like it had been before humans arrived. And so the crowds are now starting to arrive at the visitor center. It is 10.30 a.m. The temperature is a cool 117 degrees Fahrenheit. And we are gonna head about a mile and a half north to the Harmony Borax Works. Actually, before we head to the Harmony Borax Works, I think there's an airport. Yeah, it looks like on the map, there's an airport all the way down this road. I'd assume it's not a public airport. It's probably only for emergencies in case someone were to suffer from extreme heat exposure. But someone's running? What? Someone is literally going for a run. It is 115 degrees. Is that even, is that safe? Someone is literally running. And these two are too. Holy. Guys, it is 115 degrees. Those people are definitely locals. They've probably lived here for a while and have gotten quite adapted. And this is the airport straight ahead. Yeah, the landscape just turns into salt. I think this is a salt flat. You can see the white. I guess let's park real quick. So this is the small Furnace Creek Airport. It is a beautiful open airstrip. Look at those mountains. But that still just blows my mind that I saw three people running at 10.30 a.m. I could understand at like 6, 7, maybe even 8 a.m. In Las Vegas, I do not run after 8 a.m. And there are people running in 115 degree heat. That lady was running fast. She wasn't going on a jog. Like she was almost sprinting life in this isolated, remote, hot, dry, extreme place. Must be so different. And there are those runners still running now on the main road. They probably live in the Cow Creek complex, which is quite a ways north. Holy, that is insane. They have not slowed down. That is literally insane. Let's drive about a mile and a half north though to the Harmony Borax Works. I am surrounded by the stunning colors of Death Valley National Park. But over here, there's a mural, the old Harmony Borax Works. On the marsh near this point, borax was discovered in 1881 by Aaron Winters, who later sold his holdings to W.T. Coleman of San Francisco. In 1882, Coleman built the Harmony Borax Works and commissioned his superintendent to design wagons and locate a suitable route to Mojave. The work of gathering the ore was done by Chinese workmen. From this point, processed borax was transported 165 miles by 20 mule team to the railroad until 1889. So up there yonder is where the borax was originally discovered back in 1881. And it is incredible that some of the structures from probably at least 130, 140 years ago are still standing. These are some very durable brick. I wonder what type of rock. Oh, just looking at all the different types of rocks on the floor, there is, there are so many different minerals in the sediment here. Look at these colors. That is beautiful. Look at this purple. Wow. This rock is also very, very hot. 
The ground temperature right now, let's, uh, let's try to feel it. Oh, that is, okay. But as we head back up to the site where the 20 mule teams started from, how about we get back into the history? Now, Coleman wanted a pleasant place for wagons to be repaired and for his men to be able to relax. So he diverted additional water from the nearby springs and planted all sorts of trees and flowering plants. By 1885, there were full cattle, pig, and sheep farms. But unfortunately, economic misfortunes caused Coleman to sell his holdings to Frank M. Smith in 1890. And the Harmony Borex Works ceased operation shortly thereafter as Smith wanted to focus his new Pacific Coast Borax Company's efforts on other locations. So here at the base of the Harmony Borax Works trail, it has a placard that says white gold and a 20 mule team at the Harmony Borax Works around 1885. Wow, so that's what they would have looked like. Borax, the white gold of the desert, ranks as the valley's most profitable mineral. Harmony Borax Works in front of you was one of Death Valley's first borax operations. It operated from 1883 to 1888. And altogether in those six years, over 20 million pounds of borax was transferred from here, 165 miles, like that, that took 10 days back in the day to Mojave, California. Over here we have one of the wagons. So this was the road that they actually took to Mojave. We're here now in Harmony Borax Works. They went all the way down here. The mule teams pulled loads weighing up to 36 tons, including 1,200 gallons of drinking water. The rear wagon wheels were seven feet high, and the entire unit with mules was more than 100 feet long. Refining Borax. Workers refine borax by separating the mineral from unwanted muds and salts, a simple but time-consuming process. So this photo right here has turned into this. Borax will not crystallize at temperatures above 120 degrees, so Harmony Borax Works stopped operating during the summer. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. Oh, and it looks like there used to be a little stream that runs through here, or maybe in the winter time. I mean, it only gets two inches of precipitation a year. It definitely looks like there's water of some type. So maybe way back in the day, there used to be a river here. Probably used to be a dry salt lake bed too. Okay, so those houses that I saw earlier off in the distance, it says crude shelters and tents once dotted the flat below you. Chinese workers slept and ate there. The 1892 photo below taken after the works closed shows the borax works in the center of the view and the company village on the flat to the left. Okay, so... I'm standing right here and there used to be a whole village just on this flat down below. That is fascinating. And driving back into town, you can see a little green up on the hill over there, which I believe is the Furnace Creek Inn. Here on the left is called the Sunset Campground, yet it does not look like there is a single tent parked. And rightfully so, I don't know if anyone, I mean, you have to be absolutely crazy to want to tent camp in this heat. It's probably not even safe. I don't even know if they sell campground slots at this time of year. Those have to be two of the biggest crows I have seen in my life. That one is just being absolutely stationary. I am now back at the main square. The guest registration office I went in earlier is to the left. Straight ahead is a restaurant, one of two restaurants in this Oasis complex. And then behind me, we have the Desert Outfitters, Oasis shops, as well as the post office. Now, the reason that the ranch you see here, all of this has been built up to now include two restaurants, a saloon, the hotel, obviously, shops, and even an ice cream parlor, which, yeah, is just right down here on the left, is because after Harmony Borax Works closed in 1888, the ranch's caretaker at the time, Jimmy Dayton, still kept the place in tip-top shape for the subsequent decades, with the ranch offering much-needed shade, water, and socialization, for many mining prospectors who came due to tons of gold booms and gold rushes in the surrounding hills. Rhyolite, which is one of the most famous Nevada ghost towns, is actually only about 40 miles from here. Oh, I guess the post office is literally just on the side of this building. Yeah, there's the post office. It doesn't even have a window. This is the Oasis shop. I guess this is the one store in town, open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Oh, this is cool. And so do you live in town? I live on property. Oh, on property, okay. How long have you lived here? Off and on eight years. Oh, wow. Is this your favorite time of year, the summer? No, the winter is. Okay. <laughs> but this is okay. As long as you're not hiking and stuff, you do other things. Ice cream parlor is right here, but it is currently only 11, 13 p.m. It does not open until 12. I'm actually lactose intolerant, so I would not be getting ice cream anyway. 
but it still would be cool to check out the old ice cream parlor, which was apparently modeled after the 1930s. But long story short, this modern day ranch was renovated from the original Greenland Ranch back in 1933 due to the creation of Death Valley National Monument that same year, which made affordable tourist accommodation in the area necessary. And over here we have the general store. So I guess this is the main shop that you're gonna get your groceries at if you don't wanna drive all the way to Pahrump. I'd assume everything is definitely upmarked price-wise. Oh yeah. It's like a souvenir shop and then they also have groceries in the back. Let's look at the prices. Reduced fat milk, $6 per half gallon. Oat milk is $7.99. A case of pasta is $5.49. A small roll of paper towels, $3.99. This little fruit cup, $4.99. And let's look at the most important thing you need to survive, of course. A gallon of water, $4.49. And then this general store connects to, oh, I guess there's another office here at the ranch at Death Valley. General store and restrooms. Oh, this is the restaurant. Oh, and they have a little coffee shop here too. And then yeah, here's the restaurant. But while the modern day ranch at Death Valley is very old and dates back to 1933, it actually isn't the oldest hotel in the town of Furnace Creek. That honor is held by the place that Raheem works at. Let's head to the Furnace Creek Inn. Welcome to the Inn at Death Valley aka the most luxurious accommodation in Death Valley. And directly in front of the parking lot, we have Badwater Basin, which is the lowest point in North America. We are definitely going to be going there later. But first, let's tell you a little bit about this inn. Now, the inn at Death Valley was originally built by Frank Smith and the Pacific Coast Borax Company in 1927 to provide more business for his then Death Valley Railroad, which carried borax from the mines in nearby Ryan, California, to Death Valley Junction, which is a little town we're gonna to be checking out later today as well. Look at this fountain over here. Wow, this is just, you would not believe you're in the middle of a desert. This is a beautiful, beautiful accommodation. Just like with the ranch, however, this inn didn't see increased popularity until 1933 with the creation of Death Valley National Monument. And it was actually completely remodeled in 2020. It still gives off its 1927 vibes and charm, but it now has completely modern amenities. There's a spring-fed pool. There's a date palm garden I would like to check out. Stone patios and even a stargazer deck. Wow, this is so cool. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Yeah, I love this old-fashioned style. This is the restaurant that Raheem works at. If you're wondering what a regular accommodation will set you back at the Inn at Death Valley, it's around $350 to $450 per night, depending on the season. Wow, that is just a gorgeous oasis. This must be the date garden or the date palm tree garden. And then there's apparently 22 casitas, which were just added in 2020. And if you want to rent one of those, those set you back around $750 to $800 a night. So this is definitely not a cheap accommodation, but it is still just a stunning, stunning compound. I love just how hilly this, yeah, this is beautiful. Over here we have the spring-fed pool, which apparently always keeps a temperature of around 87 degrees Fahrenheit. We have some people bathing in said pool. And I'm here with Louise and Paula. What made you guys decide to come on vacation to the hottest place on earth during the hottest season on earth? Well, his parents from Puerto Rico, they wanted to know what it is to be in the hottest place in the summer. It's uh, very different, you know, Puerto Rico is very humid. Also, it's like a surreal experience because you're like in the middle of nowhere and it's like, how, how this is possible? I don't know why we keep coming. <laughs> So this isn't your first time to Death Valley? You've been no, here. second oh. time. Okay. In fact, we came last year and it was 124. Today it's gonna get to 124. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So other than the heat, is there any other reason you decided to come to Death Valley? Uh, mainly that, but then we saw the hotel when it was built and stuff. We didn't stay here the first time. The first time we came back to Glendale the same day. Oh wow, that's yeah, a big trip. That's crazy. But like, I'm in love with the hotel. What would you say is the biggest difference between heat here versus Puerto Rico? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I love the weather in Puerto Rico. It's humid. You can be under the sun, but you don't feel like you're burning. So this is worse than Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah. Oh, with the, yeah. Even with how much money would you have to be paid to live here? I wouldn't live here. So no amount of money could make you live here year round. 
No. No. Just vacations. Not year round. Well, thank you so much, guys. I'm sure the pool is very refreshing right now. Yeah. This is the mineral water at 87 degrees. You should come. Yeah. It's so good. And right next to this beautiful spring fed mineral pool is a pool bar cafe. Let's go inside and check this out. Oh, wow. Hey, how you guys doing? Destiny and Ashley, how long have you guys lived in Death Valley? Well, I've been here for a week. I've been here since January. So you're the new fresh recruit. What made you decide to move to Furnace Creek when you know there's gonna be temperatures above 120 pretty much every day? For real, I just like traveling and work. I came from Hawaii, spent like a couple months in Puerto Rico, and I found this opportunity. Why not? I like the heat. I know this is extra, but it's just to keep exploring. And what brought you here, Ashley? Um, the money. It's more than both national parks. Oh, okay. I worked at Grand Canyon as well, and they pay more here. It's a lot more remote and it a lot is. hotter here. It really so, yeah. is. You have to have a car here. And so you guys both have cars? No, no, no. Oh, no. And so then you're from Puerto Rico and you said you were from Ohio, Ashley? Yes. What would you guys both say is the biggest difference moving to a place with 130 people in a very remote part of the country? I would say just that I just already live remotely, so it's not that bad. You meet people all around the world here. Yeah. And my roommate is from Turkey. Oh, really? Okay. I met someone else who said he met someone else from Turkey. Are there a lot of people from Turkey here? Yeah. And Thailand as well, but it's really small here. There's not a lot of people. I don't really like that. So everyone knows everyone? Yes. Are there cliques in the town? or is it it, is, there is. So it's not everyone's nice to everyone? No, not at all. So what do you guys do for fun then? Drink. A lot of people drink. <laughs> we have an employee pub. We also have the recreation center, but most people just hang out and drink. I just been like going to the pool and gym. Only being here a week, so. <laughs> so have you made any friends yet, only being here a week? Yeah, my roommate came the same day as me. And of course, Ashley, because she's training. I don't have that much friends, but you don't need that much friends. So then how often do you guys head to Pahrump? Once a week. And there's only eight people for the shuttle. And would you be able to live here if Pahrump wasn't an hour away? If no. it... So how long do you guys plan on living here? Me? For like five months. One year. And you don't think you could live here long, long term? No. Yeah. No. Well, there's people here that have been like 20 years. years. Yeah, props for them, but I wouldn't do that. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> and directly next to the pool building, we have a tennis court. It is now 120 degrees, so no one is obviously out at the tennis court. But while most of the places we've explored thus far seem to be catered to tourists, obviously 136 people do live in this town. And if you're wondering where, that's where we're going next. Now there are two main neighborhoods that people live in. The first is the Indian Village, directly below the ranch at Furnace Creek. And then the second area is about five miles north in an area called Cow Creek, and down this road on the left, we have the village of the Tembisha Shoshone people. Sadly, the Tembisha Shoshone people, even though they've lived here for hundreds and hundreds of years, they actually weren't even given a village here until the 1930s, and they weren't officially recognized as a tribe until 1983. I read there are around 50 people that currently live in this village year round and more people come in the winter months as well. And welcome to Cow Creek. This is the main residential area where a lot of the National Park Service lives as well as other full-time residents of Furnace Creek who don't work for one of the hotels. There are around 80 units that people can live in here. All of them or most of them are within walking distance of one another and there's a shared library, gym, pool, and a playground. The Inyo Public County Library is currently closed. But to go off of Inyo County, Inyo County is actually the second largest county in the state of California. It's about 10,200 square miles. Yet its whole population is only about 19,000. Meaning it has a population density of 1.9 people per square mile. That's around one third the population density of Wyoming which is the least densely populated state other than Alaska. And welcome to Upper Cow Creek. We have reached sea level. So I guess Lower Cow Creek is that whole complex down there. This is such a cool road. I wonder how often there's landslides and whatnot that block this road. So at the top of this hill, Upper Cow Creek, we are happening upon the first units <laughs> Now, interestingly enough, Inyo County, California, not only has the lowest point in the United States, it actually also houses the highest point in the contiguous United States, with Mount Whitney at 14,505 feet above sea level, being only 84 miles away from Badwater Basin, 
which is 282 feet below sea level. Here on the left, we have Lower Cow Creek, can see it from afar. But let's drive back down this beautiful hill, not only to sea level, but to actually the lowest point in North America. I actually had to use the bathroom, so I stopped up again at the Furnace Creek Visitor Center, where the temperature currently reads 125 degrees Fahrenheit, or 51 degrees Celsius. Okay, back down to 124. But let's get back in the car and head to Badwater Basin, where it will probably be even hot. Look at those mineral deposits in the hills. Look at that too. We have a bunch of clouds in the sky now. Where did the clouds come from? I was like, why are there weird shadows being cast right now? And it's because there's clouds. I have never seen that before where the mountains or hills don't make the shadows. The clouds do. That is how potent the sun is. It just goes on and on and on these vast. Holy, look at that. Wow, these painted hills. <laughs> this is freaking beautiful. I have no idea what that black smoke is up there, but we have officially entered Bad Water Basin. The lowest point in North America, but it's a dry heat. You know, I used to always say, but it's a dry heat. It is still freaking hot, even if it is a dry heat. I guess this placard is gonna show all of the lowest points on Earth. So the other low point, I do wanna really check out the Salton Sea, because there's a lot of almost post-apocalyptic type of communities around Salton Sea. It says over here it's only 131 feet below sea level, but a new place was just found in Argentina recently, the Laguna del Carbon, which is the lowest point in the Americas. And then of course, over on the Jordan-Israel border, the Dead Sea is the lowest point in the world at 1,360 feet below sea level. Wow, China has a place that's 500 feet below sea level. But yes, at the bottom of these steps is the lowest point in North America at 282 feet below sea level. I actually just turned around and looked in the mountains. There is a sign which tells you where sea level is. It's right there. It says sea level. It doesn't look 282 feet above me. Distances in the desert, especially in the extreme heat, are a bit deceptive. Just driving up here, I saw the parking lot look like it was maybe a mile or two away. It ended up being six miles away when I looked at my map. Holy, I guess there's still some water. Yeah, the bad water pool. Water is rare and precious in Death Valley. Imagine the disappointment when a surveyor mapping the area could not get his mule to drink from this pool. He wrote on his map that the spring had quote unquote bad water and the name stuck. Oh, that's why. But it says this Badwater pool is not poisonous, just salty. It is also home to one of Death Valley's rarest animals, the Badwater snail. And this is the sign to prove that you are now 282 feet below sea level. There's no thermostat at the Badwater Basin, but considering that we're about 60 feet below Furnace Creek, I'd imagine it's at least a degree or two hotter here. Oh, there's a little pool. I'd imagine this water is very hot, but it can't be that, oh. It's not that bad, actually. Oh, the salt's actually quite cool. Oh no, never mind. But it just goes on and on as far as the eye can see. It would be so easy to get delirious out here. We are in the middle of a freaking massive salt flat at the bottom of North America. Over there are the Panamint Mountains, where there are actually quite a few ghost towns. A lot of the ghost towns in Death Valley, you actually aren't able to access by car. You have to hike into them. That obviously would not be safe in this weather, but there is one almost ghost town that we can access by car. Let's drive 40 miles to the town of Death Valley Junction. Population two. Oh, what is this cop doing over here? Is there an emergency? What is that car? Was that in an accident? This is California, which means there's a dispensary, even in the middle of the Mojave Desert. It kind of looks like a compound of some sort. But yes, directly to the right here, is Death Valley Junction. This town used to be a lot bigger than the town of Furnace Creek. There are still the facades of so many almost abandoned buildings or completely abandoned buildings. And welcome to Death Valley Junction. In front of me is the Amargosa Hotel and Opera House, which was originally constructed around 100 years ago. 
The hotel is actually still in operation. You can rent a room here. Although the Opera House had its last show back in 2012. It is 3.37 p.m. however, which should technically be the hottest point of the day, yet it feels a bit cooler here than even three or four hours ago in Furnace Creek. I am currently 2,041 feet above sea level, and since air cools by about three to six degrees per thousand feet of elevation, it's still hot, don't get me wrong, but it's probably 110 to 115. But let's get into the history of this town and why there's actually quite a few buildings. Now the town was originally created in 1907 to connect the Tonopah Tidewater Railroad to a borax mine in Ryan, California. And by 1910, there was a saloon, store, and brothel already in the town. I guess we're not able to actually access a lot of the town, but as you can see, there are quite a few buildings that look like nobody has lived in for decades. And that's because in 1914, the Death Valley Railroad arrived to town, which resulted in around 300 residents living in a makeshift tent city. Then around 1923, Frank Smith, with his Death Valley Railroad Company, decided that they were going to need some houses and buildings. So over the next two years, almost all of these buildings that you see right here were constructed. The borax ran out in 1928, however, resulting in most of the band being quickly abandoned. And yeah can see the buildings over there. They are literally decrepit. Oh, and there is a sandstorm of Bruin over there. Wow. Now, obviously this was a Wild West sort of town. A lot of murderous brawls occurred, a lot of hangings, a lot of people even dying from heat exposure. So many people actually believe that a lot of the buildings in this town, as well as the Amargosa Hotel and Opera House, are haunted. There's been many ghost stories. It really is a shame that all of this is private property and we can't explore them, because this would be a really cool tourist attraction even. Yeah, look at that. Literally nobody has lived in any of these buildings for at least 90 years. Welcome to historic Death Valley Junction, home of the Amargosa Opera House, hotel, cafe, tours, gift shop, performances, open all year. This town almost seems post-apocalyptic. So many buildings still in place, rusting. But while the town was in complete decline over the following decades, new life was actually breathed into Death Valley Junction when an actress and dancer by the name of Marta Beckett back in 1967 was driving through town and got a flat tire. This garage directly in front of me was the closest place where she could replace her tire. And thus, while she was waiting for her car to be repaired, she saw this Amargosa Hotel and Opera House and absolutely fell in love with the building. So the following year, she actually decided to purchase the entire building and perform in the Opera House at least once a week, every week for the next 44 years, even when no one was watching. And considering this Death Valley Junction town really is in the middle of nowhere, more often than not, no one really was watching. Now, I'm actually not able to enter the Opera House itself, but I'll overlay some images on the screen. Apparently, since often no one actually watched the performances, Marta Beckett painted an entire audience on the walls. Word soon spread of her weekly performances, regardless of the audience size, however, and this quickly became somewhat of a tourist attraction to see Marta Beckett perform for people from Las Vegas, as well as all over the world. It looks like this was a gallery or used to be. Now Beckett's last show was in 2012 and then she sadly passed away in 2017. And this is the lobby of the Amargosa Hotel. Everything that you see is exactly how it was when Marta Beckett bought the place in the late 1960s. And all of these paintings on the walls were actually painted by Marta Beckett herself. This is really cool. I feel like I took a time machine back to the 1970s. And it looks like over here we have the gravestone of Marta Beckett, or it says in celebration of Marta Beckett on your 90th birthday in honor of your love of art and dance and for your 50 years of devotion to Death Valley Junction. Thank you for your vision of preserving art of the past and for creating the most magical Amargosa Opera House. And it looks like people have left some trinkets and offerings. I am not sure what this building is across the street, but it looks like it says Lick. Yeah, L-I-K. Oh, looks like there's mannequins with different outfits. Maybe these are some of Marta Beckett's outfits that she performed with. It's a cool building. There is a bulletin board here. It says, adopt a wild horse or burrow. Okay, so here there's actually signage. It says, None of the display costumes are originals. They have no historical value. This exhibit was inaugurated on Saturday, February the 10th, 2018, 50 years to the very day Marta Beckett performed for the very first time. So yeah, February 10th, 1968, the very first performance 
at the Amargosa Opera House. It says, Death Valley Junction, the historic crossroad has been used by Indians, ranchers, farmers, settlers, and tourists. Death Valley Junction had rail service until 1940. And over here we have the Amargosa Cafe. It apparently is still operational. I wonder if it's open at 4 p.m. on a Sunday. Yeah, this building has definitely seen better and it is not open unless the door is this one. Nope. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's been opened for quite some time, actually. People have drawn in the dust that appeared on the windows. I wanna take a little peek in the garage that Marta Beckett stopped at, however. It'd be fascinating to see if any of the inside is still how it looked back in the 1960s when she stopped here. We can take a little peek through this window. And directly south of the garage, we have what I believe are old water towers. And look at that mountain on the right. It is so perfectly sharp. Obviously, this town has seen better days. It says, kill this pain on that half-finished trailer home over there. But ghost towns are places that were quickly abandoned, have always fascinated me. So if you have any suggestions of off the beaten path locations with fascinating histories that you want me to visit, please let me know in the comments. Leave a like if you enjoyed and want me to visit the coldest town in America on the coldest day of the year. This desert landscape is unlike anything I have ever seen.